Hello, folks. Today is July 1st, 2023. We have ended another month on the Gregorian calendar or the calendar of life itself. And we have entered into another chapter of God's story. And Father, I'm praying that you'll help me to get out of the way and that you will speak through the truth uh, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit yourself, who will bring all of your children uh, into all truth, because that is your role uh, and your desire as a father to raise us up in the way. And I pray that you'll help me to get out of the way so that you can do that today as we bring forth the word as you have told it to me in your son's holy and precious name, which is what all of this is about. Uh, it is about the son upholding the father. So in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, Father, let us, let us bring again a point to the law and that every king has a kingdom and every kingdom has law, rules, codes of conduct and precepts that it upholds. And again, I pray that you will help me get out of the way and just be a conduit for your spirit to speak and to teach as you will in Jesus' holy, precious name. I am a child of the lamb and of the lion, of the lamb in the sacrificial living according to how Christ conducted himself sacrificially, lowly and humbly upon this earth. And my job is to lead as well a very spirit fruit filled life, which are to express this, this, the attributes and the fruits of the tree of God himself in this earth, which is the humble life that Christ led as the lamb laying down his life or dying to all self-leading, self-desires, uh, covetousness of what the flesh, carnal, human-based uh, nature would be inclined uh, or affectionate toward in this lifetime. And to give that all up, to walk with the Spirit of God unto the mission of God in this life and unto attaining his image again. A life that listens to what the Spirit of God is saying and watches what the Spirit of God is showing and is led by the Spirit of God being a son of God. And I am a child of the lion in that the dominion of all of his kingdom will be upheld in that child. The child that will lay their life down as a lamb sacrifice in accordance to and the patterning of the son as they are a son under the sun, they are a fruit, first fruit of the capital S-O-N, son of God and son of man. And in that, the dominion of the kingdom, the rule and the reign and the law and the conduct of the kingdom of heaven will be upheld in the life of that child. Thereby, they have learned as through the lamb to be the priest, holy as he is holy, submissive as he is submissive and obedient as he is obedient and unto the spirit of God or the spirit of life itself. And in that the lion dominion of the kingship will be upheld in the life of the son and through sonship. We often want to talk about ruling and reigning with Christ and we want to talk about the kingship that is attained through sonship, but it is the sonship of laying one's life down and dying that leads us to ruling and reigning with him. So we have to be sacrificially living humans uh, unto the Lord here. We have to be sacrificially living unto the spirit of God and the spirit of life itself, dying to the spirit of sin and death. Killing and slaying the carnal flesh nature in order to walk out dominion, rule, and reign with and through Christ and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God on earth or in earth, in our earth, in our vessels as it is in heaven. Meaning as your spirit man would conduct himself with God in the heavenly realm, so shall it be in this realm in your soul man being sanctified and consecrated unto God and getting right and walking the paths of righteousness with God. In that, the manifestation of the Romans eight sons and daughters of the very living God himself will be quickened in our mortal bodies to carry this out. 
the very spirit of God himself can indwell and live straight through that person, which was his dream to begin with. To raise his children up in the way so that when they are raised up in the way and they depart not from it, he can indwell them and live his very person and existence straight through them in a carnal material realm. Because you see, he rules and reigns the spirit realm completely. But he needs us to partner with him in this material realm. He walked a flesh life before and incarnate uh, Christ was uh, in a body for himself. But that body now remains in heaven and he needs another body in this earth, which is us. And we have got to be the pattern of the lamb to lion, just like Christ. He had to die first. We have to die. A seed has to die before it can grow. He seeded us. In Christ, we have been seeded. But in Satan, we have been seated as well from the fall. And so one of those has to be killed or round up, poisoned, killed out entirely, dissolved. Like the disillusion of one marriage or yoking covenant to receive the other. We have to die to the flesh carnal nature and the flesh is enmity against the spirit. It is enemy op and opposition to with vehement hostility towards the spirit let us remember that so there are two natures that will always be in play or available in this lifetime which one you play in is your choice and mine should we uphold the kingdom of god and righteousness should we uphold the throne and the rule and the reign of the spirit of god and the spirit of life himself then we will rule and reign with Christ because Christ will be ruling and reigning in your vessel. This is how we end up ruling and reigning with Christ because he has dominion in us. But we will not get there until we kill the carnal flesh nature and uncouple from it, throwing it down. And he wants to bring up the law again because many people think that it is completely abolished. It is not completely abolished, and he is going to show us that it's not, and I'm not speaking of living by the old Moses law covenant. I am speaking of the paths, the ancient paths of righteousness and the ways of God, and he would like to detail out how very much Christ has never violated the law. In fact, if he were to have violated the law, we would not be able to have salvation whatsoever. It is because he never violated the law at all and still upholds the law in his person, in his spirit, in his body and vessel, which now reside in heaven, seated at the right hand of God that we even have access in. This is why the law cannot be abolished completely or done away with completely, because it is by that very law and living it out that we have attained salvation, so it must be upheld. But we gain entrance in or in reconciliation unto the Father again, entrance into heaven because of his record, because he upholds the law. God does not violate anything that he has put into play. He doesn't put something into play that is rejected at any point. He changes not. The things he put into play are for a reason. And as we will see, it is to show you who God is. Not just that we, could, that we fell short of that. That's secondary. God was wanting to show us his conduct, his person, and the way he rules and reigns his own vessel, his own person. And that we fell short of that. Well, that's obvious. That's clear from the fall. The old covenant was not horrendous. It was just unobtainable by fallen man. There is a beauty to the old covenant to which he's going to roll out. And Father, unless there's anything else, without further ado, I'm going to go into this. The beauty of the law of the spirit. I think that, I think that it's very sad to me that we, that we have not seen the beauty of the law of the spirit. And as you can see, I'm not speaking of the law of Moses, though the law of Moses is the fundamental background to what is meant by the beauty and the obedience to the law of the spirit now, which is actually detailed out in scripture. 
Christ came to fulfill the law, to do it perfectly to completion. Without violation or breach of it, he has never violated the law. He has never broken the law. He still upholds the law. The law was not given to only show us how far we have fallen from God's way. It was to show us God's way, his conduct. God will never lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, murder, dishonor, adulterate, walk in idolatry, be disobedient, rebellious, or any other transgression of the law of the conduct of God. God is still upholding his laws, otherwise known as the conduct of God, how he operates his person, the conducting of God. And if we are in Christ, and Christ upholds the law to this day, never having violated it, and is set down at the right hand of the Father now, then the law sits on the throne of God and reigns with it, never violating it, and has been handed all authority to rule of the Father. I cannot express the weight of his heavy anointing over me. My whole body is jerking forward right now. And folks, I tell you that because he is adamant that we are going to continue to nail this away until people understand that he has a law to his kingdom and it is going to be upheld. And it is through Christ that we are allowed in. Authority, the power or right to give orders, make decisions and enforce obedience. Root definition comes from Middle English and Old French and Latin, which is the originator or promoter. And it says to see author. Synonyms, jurisdiction, dominion, sovereignty, supremacy, and command. Conduct, organize, carry out, lead, or guide behavior. Direct the performance of, lead in a particular way. Root definition from Middle English, Old French, and Latin. Uh, conduct, meaning brought together. We are to be joined as one now with the Spirit of God. The term originally denoted a provision for safe passage, surviving in safe conduct. Later, the verb tense sense lead guide arose, hence manage and management. And then later, management of one's behavior. The original form of the word was conduit, which was preserved only in the sense of channel. See, conduit and other uses of the spelling was influenced by Latin. We are to channel his character and enforcement of it by being a conduit or an emptied vessel to be one now with the spirit of God. So as he can lead, guide, manage as management of our behavior or law of conduct by and through channel his person, his spirit and the lead of. A conduit only holds what runs through it, and we hold the one who has never violated the law and conduct of God the Father. So the law ought to run through us. In fact, be written in our hearts. And I'm going to adjust that. In this, we have gained safe passage or survive in safe conduct as we obey him, his lead, his commands, which are detailed as his authority. He conducts us like an orchestra by his rule or authority as the author, the authority figure, how he rules his own person, the laws of his own conduct. He authorizes Authorize, official permission or approval, root definition, late Middle English from French and Latin, meaning originator or promoter. See author, and it refers it back again because that's the definition we gave originally. Author, a writer of a book or article or report, an originator or creator of something, especially a plan or idea coming from Middle English, a person who invents or causes something coming from Old French and Latin, meaning increase, originate, or promote. The spelling, with, the spelling arose in the 15th century and perhaps became established under the influence of authentic. Authentic, undisputed origin, genuine, made or done in the tradition traditional or original way, or in a way that faithfully resembles an original root definition, late Middle English, Old French from Latin, meaning principle genuine. 
he is the principal one in whom we are beholden to now as he rules we will fall in line and obedience to he is the leader the ruler the high king and he upholds the law authority and conduct of his very person and in him we are same or one now with him we bear his record and his record is flawless glory to god that we do if we are in him we have a clean record showing we too uphold the law and perfectly but it is not done and gone. He didn't come to do away with it. The law of Moses was established to show us God's ways and that we could not do God's ways without error, for we were under the law of sin. In Christ, we are no longer under the law of sin, but under the law of grace. Under the law of grace means through his person, Christ, we are graced his record. And that perfect record is now legally imputed unto us in his courts of heaven. There is a book with our names written in it with a perfect record now, and it is the book of the Lamb. For he has a perfect record, and all those in him do as well. So long as we no longer walk according to the flesh, which is the law or conduct of sin and death, and we walk according to the Spirit. There is a prerequisite because to walk according to the spirit is to obey the spirit of God and have made him our Lord and master of our ways and person. But to walk according to the flesh is to obey the flesh carnal nature as our Lord and master walking according to the conduct of the sin or transgression against God's nature. Why are we so eager to see God's law or conduct of his very person done away with? Does it frighten us to be holy as he is holy, to conduct our behavior as he conducts his behavior, not perfectly, not flawlessly, but as like he conducts his person? We are no longer beholden to walking in transgression of it or imperfection of it. So why are we so afraid of God's law of conduct? Why are we afraid of how our Lord conducts himself? Why do we not see the beauty in God's ways of his person? We are now beholden or married to Christ, attached. Not married or attached to walking out the law of Moses, for Christ did that perfectly for us, and in him we too have now have fulfilled the law of Moses. Why should the law of Moses frighten us? We too have fulfilled it on Christ's record. We are beholden to a marriage directly to God now, and he upholds the law for us in his perfect person who has never violated it which means we are now in obedience, not to the law of Moses, but to the one who upholds it and rocks it out to this day, upholding it. We are beholden to the perfect one and unto obedience to the son. And the son said, the law is summed up in these two things now. Love God with everything you've got in the next guy too. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On um, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Greek word kremenumi is the word here for hang. And the word is used a total of seven times in scripture, meaning to hang up, suspend, or to be suspended, to hang. Used of one hanging on a cross and used of the law and the prophets. They are summed up or hanging on to precepts. In, the, in, in, and in Mark, the Lord is quoted speaking of command number one and command number two, which he states are the most important commands over all other commandments of the law. One and two denote a list in order, beginning the list, but not the list in full. So there are others that are not listed, which the first two hang on or are suspended on, like a list detailed and attached to those first two super important ones, but a list suspended nonetheless, just not detailed out by Christ at the moment. Definition, sum up means to give a brief summary of something. 
express a concise idea of the nature or character of someone or something of a judge. Review the evidence at the end of a case and direct the jury regarding points of law. If we are loving God the way he said to, if you love me, obey my commandments, then we will be obeying Christ. And he obeys the law of God and has never violated it. So thereby you uphold the law as well. His kingdom is run by his person. His person has never violated the laws God has put into play. He walks them out perfectly still even yet. If it were not so, we would not have a chance of salvation. For all of our salvation in Christ is relying upon him having walked out the law perfectly and never violating it. And so now we too are accounted by record, his record in the law of the courts of heaven, as walking it out perfectly. We definitely uphold the law, all laws God governs his person by, if we are in Christ, that is, for Christ upholds the law of God. We ought not be afraid of the law or conduct of God. We ought to want to assimilate to his image again, which is his likeness. And God upholds the law of the conduct of God, his person. We ought to desire to see the beauty in the law, not to attain to live it out perfectly, but to know our God. For he walks out the law perfectly, so we do not have to, and legally freed us. The law is beautiful. God is beautiful. And we need not fear the law, but God. We revere God directly now through the Son, through Christ, and Christ still has never infractioned the law. And in that spotless record, we will find our names written in the book of the Lamb. There is a reason it is called that, the record of the Lamb. We have to be under and in the Lamb now in order to receive his blood payment of walking the law out perfectly. We must have his record of flawless upholding of the law. It's his record, and he has written our names to his record, upheld in the courts of heaven by law. And thank God he has, for in the law being upheld in heaven, we have our freedom in and through the channel of Christ. The law is beautiful, and because of the law of God, we have freedom in Christ and his flawless record of upholding the law of God. We now fall in line to Christ who falls in line to the law of God, this law of the spirit. We obey Christ's commands, which is his authority. And we have entrance into heaven, the kingdom, and the father. We become heirs with him to, the, to God's home, dominion, and family. And all because we uphold the law in Christ. We cannot do away with the very law that gains us entry into heaven, the law or governing of Christ and the spirit that was attained by living under and in accordance to the law given to Moses by God. Definition law, the system of rules which a particular country, kingdom, or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and by which it enforces. Rule of correct behavior or procedure. The body of divine commandments as expressed in the Bible or other religious texts. And if you love me, you will obey my commands. Root definition comes from Old English and Old Norse, meaning something laid down or fixed. He didn't do away with the law, only the penalty of it. By imputing his record upon us, writing our names in his book, the book or record of the Lamb and his perfect upholding of the law. We have gained attachment to his record with our names written in because we now are beholden to him and he holds his record of flawlessly upholding of the law, even now to this day. Impute. Represent something, especially something undesirable, as being done, caused, or possessed by someone. An attribute. Ascribe righteousness, guilt, etc. to someone by virtue of a similar quality in another. Root definition comes from Middle English and Old French and Latin, meaning enter in the account in towards and reckon beholden owing thanks or having a duty to someone in return for help or a service root definition from middle english and archaic uh, past part part participle of behold in the otherwise unrecorded sense bound we enter in on the account of christ and his perfect record that means a law exists 
and we are failing at getting in by it and living up to it before Christ. And it is now reckoned toward us or imputed. And we are bound to him now, not the old covenant, but bound and married as one to him now in a duty to uphold obedience to him as he is the authority figure over us. He is the author or authority, and he is the finisher of our faith or fidelity to God. You see, because he never broke fidelity to God when he upheld the law. That is the point. Finisher in Greek it comes from the, the root definition of G5048, a completer, that is a consummator, a finisher. And the definition of consummate is to make complete, join, make perfect or whole, root definition from Middle English, completed, accomplished, comes from Latin, brought to completion, and altogether, sum total, and highest supreme. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Definition condemnation here in the Greek is from the root G2632, meaning adverse sentencing or verdict. To have a verdict, there is a law in play and a court system. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There are two laws or conducts in play at all times, the flesh carnal nature of sin and death, which is estrangement from God in his way, and the law of the spirit of life attained through the channel of Christ Jesus. And the law of the spirit of life, when upheld and joined to Christ, frees us from the bondage or yoke to the law of sin and death. For what the law given to Moses could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, meaning man was weak through the flesh and could not do it flawlessly, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That means took sin in the flesh, captive, jailed it and locked it up, refusing it and gaining victory over it. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, nature of sin and death and estrangement, but after the spirit, the law of the spirit and life of God. For they that are after the flesh do mind or exercise, entertain, have sentiment or opinion for, are mentally disposed to, led in direction of, interests one's self unto in obedience with set affections on, thinking same-minded with the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. One set of people minding the ways of the flesh as master and another set of people set apart ones minding the ways of the spirit of God and of life. For to be carnally minded, remember the above definition of minding it as a master or leader with which we are mentally disposed to, having affectionate sentiment and opinion toward, interesting ourselves unto it in obedience of, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Life and peace. Peace here in the Greek of G1515 is to join by implication be prosperous or have prosperity and be at one peace quietness and rest plus plus set at one again because the carnal mind is enmity or hostile and opposition to enemy in hatred against god for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can it be here we can see there is a law of God and the carnal person will be in opposition to it, hostile toward it with hatred even. Hatred, intense, passionate, dislike or ill will, root definition, a condition. And the word law used here from the Greek of 3551 means the law or the regulation specifically of Moses, including the volume of and the volume of the Old Testament uh, books and also of the gospel or figuratively a principle. So it's the law, regulation and principle or principles of God. So then they that are in 
which is a resting position, the flesh, human nature, carnally minded. So they're resting in the human nature, carnally minded, cannot please God, which means be agreeable and seek to be so. Seek to be in agreement with God. But you are not in a resting position of the flesh, but in a resting position of the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells, that means resides, inhabits, and cohabitates in you. Huge prerequisite there, if. It be that God inhabits and cohabitates with you inside of you, his spirit in lead and upheld within. Now, if any man does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not of his. That means if someone does not have the Holy Spirit cohabitating within them, indwelling the house or the temple, he is not God's child. And if Christ be in you, the body as a sound whole is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness, which is equity or equality of character and actions through justification. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells or abides and cohabits in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or vitalize and make alive again your mortal liable to die bodies or sound whole by his spirit that dwells in you. When I say sound whole, that means your whole person, your whole being. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh or the law of sin and death. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die and die off is what that means, literally or figuratively be slain. But if you through the spirit do mortify or kill and put to death the deeds and practices, actions and functions of office of work, the body or the flesh, you shall live or be quickened by life. For as many as are led by, driven by, and induced of the spirit of, which is the breath of, the vital principle mental disposition of God, they are the sons, the child or the foal, one born of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage or slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, placing as a son, sonship to God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We do not cry out as ones estranged from God any longer because we are subject to his spirit and the law and authority of his person. We now cry out, Father, because we are placed as sons obeying the leadership, law, and conduct of the law of the spirit of life now, the spirit of God, making us sons to the spirit and in reconciliation and not estrangement and bondage to the law of sin and Satan any longer. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs or partitioning, getting apportionment, a sharer by lot and an inheritor, a possessor. We are heirs of God, the high supreme magistrate. That's law upholder, folks. And joint heirs, participants in common together through joining with Christ. If it be so that we suffer or experience pain jointly, or of the same kind to sympathize, to sympathize with him. We may be also glorified or exalted to dignity in company with him. And those are all the definitions that were in Strong's that are in those brackets, folks. There is a reason they are called Romans 8 children who will manifest as sons of God, for they uphold the law of the spirit of life and God through and with and by the lead of Christ as they have ceased from obeying the law of the flesh and now obey the law of the spirit of God. The Romans 8 manifesting children of God do not shun the law or conduct of God, his person. Nay, they embrace him, his person, his conduct and image and uphold it and assimilate into it his conduct. They consummate the relationship becoming whole and perfect in and through Christ and obedience to his authority or his command as he has been made most supreme or most high one in their hearts and lives. His conducting is upheld and he conducts his person flawlessly to the law of God even to this day as he is subject to or in subjection to the law and conduct of the father. Subjection. The action of subjecting a country or person to one's control or the fact of being subjected. Are we not subject to Christ and was not and is not Christ subject to the father and the lead of his Holy Spirit? The father's children see the beauty and the depth of the ancient paths 
the old ways, and they are grateful that through Christ we have attained the perfect or whole record of the law as well. And so they live not according to the law or conduct of the flesh, but according to the conducting of the spirit and the law of God. So they will manifest his spirit right through. So they will manifest his spirit right through them. To be one with the God who upholds the law is to love the beauty of the law as God does, for the law is his nature, and we are to be gaining and being more of his image or nature day by day. In that, we need to see the beauty of his nature, and the beauty of his nature is seen in his law, his ways in which his person and his kingdom are conducted. He and it are not lawless. I am perplexed when people say people don't want to support God or his law, even the old law of Moses, not perform it flawlessly, but support it within their inner man. Is this not what Abraham, Enoch, and Job did? And God said they were upright men issuing evil right with God and pleased him? Which parts of the old law were detestable? Which parts of the old law were without reason or purpose? Was the old way detestable in a day of rest honoring our parents namely god no other gods but him excuse me no engraved images we should worship that we should not take god's name or reputation highly or in vain or vanity of emptiness and no reverence or in not taking human life or not committing adultery disloyalty or was it detestable to not steal or not to lie, or not to covet, desiring what others have. And those are just the Ten Commandments of the old law. Are those horrible and to be vehemently hated? And God even said to Moses, You shall not make with me gods of silver or gold, but you shall make me an altar of earth and shall sacrifice thereon. Do we understand that means spiritually, figuratively, your dirt person will honor him directly, a living sacrifice unto him? Is that to be detested or run from? An altar of hewn stone symbolic of being built solidly in Christ now, is that to be detested? And that was referenced in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, 26, neither shall you go up by steps unto my altar that your nakedness be not discovered there. Symbolically direct intimacy with God, nothing hidden, all exposed. Is that detestable to be upholden? The old was ratified by blood and the new covenant in Christ the same. Exodus 24, 7 through 8. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you concerning all these words. Ought we detest the sprinkling of Christ's blood, walking out the pattern of the old law, perfectly fulfilling it, or perhaps the book of the covenant, which is now the Lamb's book and record? of which will be read at the judgment in a final judgment of our freedom, as our names are read in a court of law, detailing that we have fulfilled the old law through Christ and stand with and in Christ in the law of the Spirit, now obeying all he says and leads us in now. Ought we despise the pattern of sprinkling the blood upon the people in at one minute with God, declaring the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with us concerning all the word? The old and ancient paths are the symbolic, symbolic paths of what Christ would and did walk out. They are patterned after the new covenant and how Christ would beautifully fulfill it all and on our behalf, as now we are beholden to God himself, not a list of laws. But to be in subjection to his person now, who is the person of the law, he upholds the law and he will lead us and teach us his ways, which are his character and behavior, his conduct. No longer beholden to the death, sin, nature, but he, life, spirit, nature of God, the law of the spirit, conduct. But everything given to us in the Old Testament law was beautiful, for it foretold of Christ, the Son, and all he would do and be for us and with us. The law is beautiful, not detestable, and Christ is the ultimate upholder of the law of the spirit, and we reside within the one who upholds the law to this day. The law being the behavior, conduct, and character of God holy. And we are to be holy as he is holy. That's a character reference and reference to how he conducts or how he regulates his principled conduct, as that was the definition of law in Romans 8. I am not here to tell you to live by the letter of the law, for that is death. The letter of the law is to live it to a T or perfectly, like a book or text of laws. But instead to live by the spirit of the law, which is what God said above. 
the spirit of something is the breath and the vital principles of a thing, as noted here in Strong's spirit. The current of breath, the rational or vital, vital principle of mental disposition of God, the Holy Spirit, ghost life, spiritually minded. Spirit, G, 4151 in the Greek is pneuma, and that is what I defined above. Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be them, to them a God, and they will be to me a people. He has law, he says so himself, for he conducts himself lawfully. And if we are in him, in Christ, we will have the law of the Spirit written in our hearts. Hearts are unto obedience and reverence of the Lord God holy, if he is our father and fathering us in our ways. He, his ways are his law of spiritual conduct. When Paul discussed the law, he was often concerned with the entire law of Moses, and he wrote that Christians were not under that authority of that law, but that our obligation is now to obey God and is defined by a different law, a spiritual law, which in some cases overlaps Old Testament laws, but in other cases supersedes them. The high priesthood of Jesus Christ is contrasted with the Levitical high priesthood. The ministry Jesus received is far superior to the Levitical ministry, and his covenant is far superior to the old covenant, but there still is a priesthood and covenant, a new one, in him. They sacrificed blood for blood in the old ways, and Christ did the same with his perfect blood sacrifice. Christ did not violate the code of the conduct of the, the code of the conduct of the father put in play that the father put in play but lived it out upholding it which is which is to say respecting it when we say the old covenant is obsolete we are saying being married to that and to be faithful to that is obsolete now as we have the new covenant the new marriage to christ to be upheld now we are beholden to christ the person not to a list of ordinances written down but to the person of christ himself as he leads of his very person and Christ is a lawful upholder of the law. So as now we are too through his record and the laws written on our hearts. All that is his spiritual conduct was symbolically figuratively referenced in the old covenant under the ancient paths or ways. And it's beautiful, not detestable. The ancient paths, Jeremiah 6, 16 through 17, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Less than 20 years before Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, first invaded Judah and Jerusalem, God told the people through Jeremiah that the judgment was coming, and it was certain, and at that point it was unavoidable. God had repeatedly warned the people by revealing his truth through the various prophets, and he had told the people of Israel and Judah to look for the ancient paths, that God provided, Jeremiah 6, 16. Sadly, the people did not heed those exhortations and instead turned away from what God had said. They rejected those ancient paths and instead walked a path deserving of and ultimately receiving judgment from God at the hands of the Babylonians. And that was received from gotquestions.com. We are repeating a pattern here. We often wonder why Babylon 2.0 will fall harder than the first one, because we did not heed God, nor his spirit's instruction, nor the paths, the ancient paths. We are to learn from the ancient paths, the ancient principles God has put into play. If not, we are destined to repeat them, hence the fall of Babylon 2.0 in the book of Revelation. For the fall of Babylon is relative to the dismissal, refusal, and rejection of living according to the lead of the Holy Spirit by his law and by his conduct, and instead according to the flesh. The flesh hates the law, conduct of God, and his paths of holiness and righteousness, and will talk terribly about the law of God and the law of the Spirit and life because it is enemy of it. The children of God love the paths of righteousness, the ancient paths, and see the beauty in God and his holiness and the paths of his conduct and character. And they seek to attain it again in and through Christ, returning to the image of the Father. The old law is not something to be shunned and detested, but appreciated, learned from, and respected, not lived under, but upheld in Christ, meaning honor it through Christ. 
He gave it to us for a reason, to learn of God, his ways, his conduct, and why it is to be cherished, his way and conduct. For he will be returning us to all of that. In heaven and the new earth, we too will walk out perfection of the law and conduct of God holy. We ought to see the beauty in the old and ancient past, for we too will adhere to them flawlessly as Christ the first son shows us. I love the law. I seek not to live by the letter of it, for that kills, meaning we will fall short and fail and be estranged from God forever if we try to live it out perfectly. Hence our need for Christ and reliance upon God, but instead to honor it, respect it, cherish it, as Christ conducted his whole person according to it as he walked this earth. Ought that not be noted as worthy and important when the very conduct of Christ's inner person was subject willingly to it, and he is the ultimate authority of love and obedience to the Father? Nothing is by accident or frivolous where God is concerned. The law is the same. God upholds the law. He is law abiding, and we are too if we live in and with him, and his spirit indwells us and writes those laws of conduct on our hearts. We should love and cherish the law and not try to live it out perfectly, but see the value in it. Christ did and still does. And we are in him and his law is written in our hearts. It is written. Romans 8.14, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And sons of God love God, and in loving him, obey his commandments as they find value in them and in him, the law and the leading of the spirit and of life in Christ Jesus. And folks, that is the extent of what he has given me today. And um, his point is that uh, if, if the law was completely done away with, we wouldn't even have salvation or an entrance in. The fact that he still upholds that law to this day, that he has never infractioned it, is the ability and way to which we enter the kingdom. That's why he's the door, meaning he, like we have to literally be tied to him, united to him, under his rule, and made him our master uh, to which we obey, listen to, heed, and are reformed by in the refiner's fire, or we don't get in through his perfect record, because what he did was he walked out. Um, being refined unto God, meaning he disciplined himself under the leadership of God. And in, if we're in Christ, to which all authority has been given to him now, which means we have to be subject to him, we'll do the same because he's the teacher thereof. He is the first son, capital S-O-N, who is going to teach the other little S-O-Ns, all of the rest of us, how to walk this out with the father as well, which is to be obedient to him and his way and his conduct and his person. So without God still upholding that law, it has it has to it has to exist still because that's our way in. The, the penalty to us has been abolished and wiped away. That's amazing, because if we infraction it now, uh, we're not held to, to the penalty of the law. But the law exists because it has to exist because that was the way back into the kingdom. Only perfection can enter back into the kingdom perfection of God's character and his ways that was achieved through Christ. So the, the old law is, is not just some rules and regs. It's perfection. It is, this is what perfection is. And we were like, Oh, well, we can't do that. We literally, we need help. And so the father sent the son because he can do it perfectly because he's God. Even though he laid it aside and came as sinful man, he still had to perform it to a T and discipline himself and throw down the carnal nature that wanted to scream against him and lead him in, it, in, in, in its ways by Satan. And he wouldn't allow that. We fail at that. We are not flawless in all our ways like Christ. But being tied to Christ yoked up to him in this life where he is now our Lord and master. We have a perfect record through him, but there still is a law because that perfect record has to be upheld somewhere. And there's still a book of a covenant like the old Moses law, but it's now called the book of the lamb. Everything was patterned in the old Testament after what would come in the new Testament and be perfected in Christ. So we do not have to walk it out perfectly. We have 
gotten the perfect record of Christ, but we definitely got to walk it out with Christ then. We got to walk out being yoked to him and being led by him as our Lord and master, because if he's not, if the spirit of God and the spirit of life is not our Lord and master, then we are still held to the yoke bondage of the spirit of the flesh being our, by being our, our Lord and master. That's why we have to kill the flesh nature. It's why we have to be led by the Spirit of God because it is the it is the sons of God who are the ones who are led by His Spirit, not by the Spirit of the fallen flesh, carnal nature. There is a Spirit of that. It's the Spirit of the air down here, the Spirit of this world, Satan. And he gave us an altar. He said, not an altar made out of silver or gold. I want an altar made out of earth. That would be flesh and bodies, earthen bodies, earthen vessels. Symbolically speaking, spiritually speaking. That's why Christ now calls us the temple. The altar is your heart, folks. And on that heart is what? Written laws, 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 laws. He's not going to get away from that. That laws are behavior conducts to which you conduct your person. He has a way, and it's ancient paths, old, old paths. When we first came out of him, we walked the old paths. For however long he had us looking at us before he put us into a body, we walked those paths because we only came from him, and he walks those paths. So we've got to get back to the paths of righteousness and back to the, the ancient paths, which is the ancient direction, the ancient directing of God the old way of which God conducts his person and how we were to operate before the fall, which didn't have nothing to do with a broken carnal nature. So that's got to go out the door. And once we get that out the door, we'll walk according to the spirit of God again, the ancient paths and the paths of righteousness. And that is why the judgment is coming to Babylon 2.0 again, because we have fallen so far from that. And we've become a people who actually hate talking about the law. We hate the law. Do away with the Old Testament. We don't have to. We're just going to quote the New Testament all the time. Well, the New Testament is the reflection of the Old Testament perfected in Christ. So we ought to learn from the Old Testament of why God put it into play, because those are conduct attributes of how God conducts himself and his kingdom to which you, if you're on your way there, are going to be subject to. And if you uphold the kingdom in this earth and you live out of two realms, you're already upholding the law here through Christ, the perfecter of it. But he definitely is writing it on your heart to obey. You're not going to want to lie and cheat and steal and kill people and dishonor people and uphold pride and the carnal nature. You will actually vehemently hate that because the flesh vehemently is hostile against the spirit and the spirit is vehemently hostile against the flesh. It's one or the other. The glory to God is that we, we, we don't have to rock it out perfectly. We will make mistakes. And that is his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy. He is the ultimate merciful one, the ultimate gracious one who has imputed his record to us. But he definitely wants to raise us up in the way as a father. Because that's your salvation here. You have an enemy against you at all times. Satan, and he comes through that carnal flesh, broken nature. So if you're going to uphold that, then he's going to have rule in your life in some way, shape, or form. And you will be in detriment here. Your soul will be subject to hell here. You'll go through hell. And there's a consequence to what we sow. We will reap it because it will grow up into a harvest coming to maturity that has to be dealt with or played out. In heaven, there is no sin. In heaven, there is no iniquity, rebelliousness, or any contrary nature than the nature of God. Neither in the new kingdom is there, in the new earth. We will be as like God completely and fully. So we ought to understand how his nature of his person operates now and respect him in that. That's what he wants us to point out today. This is about honoring and cherishing and respecting the old law for why it was even put into play. Period. That's it. Not beholden to it. Why was it put into play? What ought we be learning about God from it? And what ought we have been learning or seeing how Christ patterned it all and perfected it in the New Testament? It's a reflection. Only it's a perfected reflection in the New Testament. The Old Testament was a dimly dark reflection of Christ 
Christ is a perfected, shiny, brilliant uh, reflection of the Old Testament as walked it out perfectly. But it, it does still exist because that it has to be upheld. The law had to be upheld. That, that, that's why Christ had to come. Nobody could uphold it perfectly. The law had to be upheld because it's the conduct and the way the kingdom runs. And the only one that could do that was God. And he said, I will pull out all the stops and I will do it myself. I will send the son. And that son will model to all the other sons the kingdom and the upholding of the kingdom. And through him, as the laws will be written on their hearts, he will then guide them as Lord and Savior and walk them in the ways of the ancient paths and the paths of righteousness. Not expecting them to walk it out perfectly, but expecting them to walk it out with Christ. To work it out with Christ. To work out our salvation with fear, which is reverence and trembling. Like it's a big deal. Because there's a reap and sow down here. If we uphold the other kingdom, then we're going to reap some consequences or some happenings and results in life we don't want. We, we definitely don't want. But likewise, if we are going to walk out with God, the spirit of the law of God and the law of, of life itself, if we're going to walk that out with God, then we're going to be breaking up with the law of sin and death which is estrangement and transgressing his way. Sin is transgressing his way and death is estrangement. So essentially, if we're going to walk with Christ, we're going to walk in agreement with God, how he conducts his person. Like we're going to agree with that. Yes, that is the right way. Yes, I need to walk those ways. I may not do it perfectly, but yes, that's the right way to be. Yes, you are the perfect one. Yes, we need to be like you. That is to not transgress his way. That is to not sin. And in that you're reconciled, you're in agreement. So you're now long, no longer estranged, which is death. So you're upholding the law of life, which is to come into agreement with God, with how his person is regulated, and to allow him to write those regulations on your heart, how he's going to regulate you, how the spirit of God lives, the spirit of life itself. And that spirit is going to regulate you. He's going to be the authority figure in your life, and he's going to author you and finish you. And your name will be written in the covenant book, like what Moses quoted, the covenant book. Only now it's called the, the Lamb's book. And the Lamb's book really is the record of him walking it out perfectly. And in his account now, his book, your name is written and my name is written. That is the legal, the legal judgment that will be upheld like a scroll opened up in the courts of heaven that says this one walked it out perfectly. Even if our physical person never did that, we through Christ and the spirit did and do see, because if he did and still does, then you did and still do. So if we're upholding it perfectly through him, then we ought to be trying to see the beauty and why he put it into play in the first place. And realizing that honoring our parents is a good thing, especially namely him, him being the parent of us, first and foremost, that lying, cheating and stealing is not good. God doesn't do that. We ought not do that. I mean, these things should make sense to us to where we see the beauty and the freedom in living that way. Because if we don't uphold those things and we don't live that way, we're still yoked to the flesh. And that is a very dangerous place to be playing when your hope is that you're you're in Christ and on your way to heaven. Like now and then later. But if we're not going to uphold Christ in our lives, which means being the one who dictates how he, your person is to be raised up in the way and governed, I, I don't see how Romans 8.1 applies then. For there is now no more jail sentence or condemnation to those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We have to be walking according to his leadership. And his leadership is from a king, a high king at that, who upholds his law of his kingdom. And if we're not even going to try to obey him, we're not even going to try to to walk with him as he walks and to be reformed into his image, there's a major problem where we're upholding the flesh still. And that's a dangerous place to play. 
he's wanting us to note that there is very much a law still in play because that law is how you got your freedom. It wasn't like he just walked out the law and then he was like, now there is no more law. We better have a law because there's a judgment still coming, which means there's a court case coming. And a mediator, he mediates court cases. That means um, disputes. I dispute the name of this one, you know, because we got an accuser of the brethren. This one is, is part of my kingdom. And then God's going to have to come in and mediate that case. I pray that we all, Father, I pray that we all understand this and that we don't, and that to the glory of God, we don't have to uphold that law to a T and, and the penalty of it. But we ought to learn that that's your conduct and that's your behavior of how you run your kingdom and that when we step over there, we're going to be doing the same. We're going to be, if we're equal to Christ on the throne, we're equal to Christ and Christ is a, a lawful upholder of the law. So we should see the beauty in the spirit of the law now, which, which really means, do you get the gist of it? Do you get the point and premise and principles of it? And are you trying, right? Because the spirit means the vital principle of your person. I pray that you help us all understand this, Father, in your son's holy and precious name. I pray you help us to understand this all.